Good morning to everyone. I am Leonardo Kirko, and I am a postdoc here at Institution Le Ronde Lambert. But today, I will talk about the steady optimal control of fluid structure interaction system. That was the main topic of my PhD thesis that was done at University of Bologna in Italy with Professor Manservisi. This is the outline of my presentation. Of course, I will start with an, with an introduction. Then I will show you a couple of FSI models, a, um, a standard FSI model, and then a multi-scale model. Then I will uh, spend some words about the adjoint optimal control. And finally, I'll show you uh, a couple of examples, one with distributed control and standard FSI model, and the second one, uh, pressure boundary control with uh, the multi-scale model. So what is uh, a fluid structure interaction system? Here we have some examples. On the top left, we can see the uh, well-known Tacoma Bridge that, uh, due to a high wind, started to oscillate. Uh, and due to the resonance, it also break. And this is an example of FSI, where we have a mutual interaction between a fluid that deforms a solid, mainly due to its pressure. And the solid changes its shape. And the change in the shape of the solid changes as well the fluid flow configuration. Here we have other examples, such as a parachute in the middle. FSI is also very uh, studied in the field of hemodynamics, such as here. That is the science that studies the flow of the blood inside our vessels. And our vessels are flexible and are usually modeled with FSI. Also, FSI is studied in the uh, field of uh, thin wings that can deform. And here we have an, uh, a graphical description of an FSI problem. On the left, uh, there is the so-called reference configuration where there is no displacement at the beginning of, of the simulation. The, the, the region in white is the fluid region. And you can see the obstacle in the middle colored in gray. And on the right, we have the so-called deformed configuration, where we can see that the fluid has deformed the solid, and the solid, we can expect, has changed the fluid flow configuration. So the first thing that we have to take into account is the so-called displacement of the solid, which is the, our first unknown of the problem. And the displacement is called eta, for example and determines the displacement from the initial configuration to the reference configuration, to the deformed configuration. Our second unknown of the problem is the velocity, of course. And in the fluids, it can be solved from the Navier-Stokes equation, for example. And we also have a velocity of the, of the solid that it is defined as the, um, as the first derivative in time of the displacement, of course. And one aspect I would like to talk is the so-called arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian method, or ALE. So first start with the uh, standard Eulerian you probably know very well. In a Eulerian approach, the mesh is fixed, and the material particles are moving into the mesh. While in a Lagrangian approach, that is the most used approach in uh, solid mechanics, the mesh and the particles move together. But since we are solving an FSI problem, we probably have to mix these two approaches. So in the, in the solid, we will use a purely Lagrangian approach. So the, the displacement of coming from the uh, solution of solid mechanics will determine the displacement also of the mesh points. While in the fluid, the, we, we can choose an arbitrary uh, law for moving the points of the mesh, and it is the so-called arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian. For example, if we, uh, we can take, we can keep the elements of the fluid fixed, and we can recover a purely Eulerian approach, but this would lead to some problems in the mesh. For example, all the displacement would be located around this fluid solid interface, and we would have uh, a bad aspect ratio for some elements, at least. So with this in mind, we have to compute this uh, fluid uh, deformation, deformation. And it is computed here. It can be computed, for example, as the solution of a Laplace operator. 
that takes into as boundary condition, we can say, the interface displacement coming from the solution of the solid equations. And then we also have the ALE velocity here that is computed as the time derivative of the fluid displacement. So FSI is an inherently nonlinear problem since our unknowns um, affect the domain and the do so the domain depends on the unknown. So this is clearly nonlinear. Here we have some examples just to uh, clarify what I'm saying. Here is an example of an FSI simulation. The, the beam in red is a solid that is fluctuating up and down. And the rest of, the, of course, is the fluid. And we can see that the solid is moving. It's just uh, moving due to the presence of the fluid. And the sol we can see that the solid is altering the fluid flow configuration that we would have, for example, with the standard uh, uh, flow around the cylinder. And in this second video, I will show you the motion of the mesh elements in the, in the fluid, for example. We can clearly see that these elements are moving because they are the, the ones that are closer to the interface, to the, to the beam. And we can see that since they all move, they all stretch, the element aspect ratio is quite good everywhere, in this part at least. And probably we can see also that these elements are quite thin and probably um, it, it also may lead to some problems if we undergo larger, larger displacement. So, uh, but today we'll talk also about optimal control and what is the optimal control and how it uh, relates to FSI. So with control, we mean to change the behavior of a system, of course, and optimal means to do so in the most efficient way. So this is our optimal control uh, for FSI. And what are the key points of the, our problem? The first one is that, of course, FSI is nonlinear, so we have to uh, solve taking into account that, uh, for example, using a fixed point iteration or other strategies. Moreover, uh, the time dependent at joint optimization would be hugely expensive since we would have to solve the joint backwards and uh, uh, in time. So we will, I just added the steady problem. Finally, I will show you the monolithic formulation and compared to the segregated formulation where we have conforming grids at the fluid solid interface. And what I did in, me, in my PhD was implementing the FSI solver and the adjoint solver, and I did that in an in-house finite element code, which is called FIMUS, and is developed at the uh, University of Bologna, and you can find that on GitHub, it, uh, it is an open source code. And uh, I also had to implement the gradient-based algorithm. Okay, now, we can shift to the some equation. Those are the equations that uh, you have to solve, for example, for the solid. And uh, it's a quite simple equation. Um, I've chosen as a cons uh, constitutive um, law as that of a sand van and Kirchhoff model, because it's simple, it is linear here in the, in the displacement. And we have that uh, the, the physical properties are determined by the Lamer parameters, and they are linked together by the Poisson ratio, for example. And the an interesting case is that of uh, the incompressible solid, which means that uh, the Lamer parameters lambda tends to infinity. And then we have that the divergence of the displacement tends to zero, so we basically the volume is conserved. But as I said, I will show you the steady problem, so the time derivative is zero and will disappear. For the liquid, we have to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, of course, continuity of the velocity, and the uh, momentum equation. Here in the advective term, we have the ALE velocity because we have, we have to consider that, of course. And uh, 
but we want to solve an FSI couple problem. So we have to take into account the interface condition that we must satisfy at the fluid solid interface. And those are the continuity of the normal components of the stress tensors as seen from the fluid part as, and as well as from the solid part and the continuity of the velocities. Again, we are solving a steady problem, so the time derivatives disappears. The ALE, ve ALE velocity is null, is zero, since the mesh is fixed uh, at, uh, at steady state. And the interface condition, the velocity must be zero, because otherwise we would not be steady. OK, so in order to solve the uh, finite element problem, we use the variational formulation. So we integrate over our control domain and multiply it by the appropriate test function. And uh, we also integrated by parts the terms with the uh, stress tensor. And we obtain these two contributions here and here. One comes from the fluid, the other comes from the solid. But due to the interface condition that I've shown you before, since we also are using a monolithic approach, they disappear because they are automatically imposed and we do not need to compute them and uh, to consider them. So now I will explain, try to explain what is a monolithic approach. So in our FSI problem, we have these three problems. We have to solve the fluid problem with the Navier-Stokes equation, the solid problem with the equation of solid mechanics, and we have the mesh super problem. If you are solving with a segregated approach, we use different solvers for every of this problem. So for example, for the fluid, you can use your favorite solver. For the solid, you can choose another solver. And when you solve the fluid equation, after that, you have the, to compute the uh, normal component of the stress tensor of the interface. And you have to use that as a boundary condition, as a Neumann boundary condition for the solid. Then you can solve your problem, solid problem, and you get the uh, solid velocity at the interface, and you apply that as a boundary condition, Dirichlet type, for the fluid. Finally, you also have to consider the displacement. For the solid, it, it, it comes from the equation. And for the fluid, you have to solve, for example, the Laplace operator. So this is a segregated approach. We are using different solvers. That can be an advantage if you want to reuse available solvers. You don't need to uh, write your own solver. But uh, some drawbacks are that the interface coupling conditions that I've shown you before have to be imposed iteratively. So it was, it, that may lead to some convergence issues. While in, in a monolithic approach, this problems are solved together. You, so you have to write your own FSI code, FSI solver. And, uh, but the, the advantage is that the interface coupling conditions are automatically imposed. Of course, the solver may take some, may, may be, may take some time longer than a uh, um, very optimized code for purely CFT or purely solid mechanics. But you have, in general, some better convergence properties. So once that you have uh, written, for example, your monolithic code, of course, you want to test it against some benchmark. And in FSI, there is this benchmark well known from Turek and Hron. And you, it is the one that I've shown you before, more or less. And there is a, a, a solid obstacle that is attached to a cylinder. And you have to compute some interesting quantities, such as the drag, the, the lift, and the beam tip displacement. You, this uh, benchmark also features some purely CFD tests that are called partial computational tests. So you fix a very rigid structure to avoid the, the displacement. You can solve a purely computational mechanics problem where the fluid is neglected, and you apply gravity to the solid. And finally, you have to solve the fully coupled FSI problem. Of course, you have a lot of uh, parameters. I will not to you show you in details. But uh, the fluid properties are those of the pure CFD test, of course. And the solid properties are those of the 
pure solid mechanic test. Those are the results that I have obtained. On the top left, there is the fluid velocity. And on the, on the right, the pressure. The displacement is reported here in these tables. And it is very small, a very small displacement. But we can see that uh, by refining the grid, I used a multi-grid approach, the, the, the results t tend to converge to the reference values, and also for the drag and for the lift coefficient. So I have validated my code, and uh, I was able to move to the uh, optimal control part. But we also decided to study a multi-scale model because, of course, the uh, if an FSI simulation may take quite, quite a long time. So with this multi-scale model, we basically collapse the solid into, a, um, into the boundary of the fluid. For example, you can see here that the solid is the region represented in red. And this is the standard FSI approach. While here, the solid collapses into this boundary, gamma. So the structure equations now become boundary condition for the fluids. And we just have to uh, write our the, the appropriate boundary condition in our fluid solver. This is a, a good point for using this method. It also has good uh, um, stability dealing with thin structures, because we don't have the problems of, for example, intersecting elements, because we don't have solid elements. Of course, we also overcome the problem of, of having a conforming grid at the interface because we don't have, again, to mesh the solid. But the positive aspect is that the, the good properties of the monolithic coupling are conserved, so the coupling conditions are automatically imposed and taken into account. Here it is an example. This is a shell, more or less, in three dimension, a cylindrical shell. And we apply a pulsating pressure here that goes up and down. And we can see that when the pressure is higher, the, the, the tube, tube gets, gets larger. Up. And this pressure wave propagates into the channel. So which model did I choose for the multi-scale model? I used the weak formulation of the Coiter equation that is reported on top, but this is quite complex due to this term here. And uh, I consider some hypotheses to simplify this problem, such as a small membrane deformation. I consider only an isotropic homogeneous material. And this model applies to cylindrical shell with only normal displacement that, of course, in a cylindrical geometry means only radial displacement. So our displacement here, for example, is not anymore a vector quantity, but it is just a scalar quantity. And I neglected the pre-stress model to simplify that. So after all these hypotheses, we get this equation here that has to be imposed as a boundary condition on the fluid boundary. There is mainly this term, beta, that takes into account the, uh, the solid properties and the solid geometry that would we would have used to solve this so-called standard FSI problem. Again, here we have the time derivative that in the um, steady problem disappear. So in order to write our monolithic coupled for variational formulation, we are still using the Navier-Stokes equation for the fluid problem. And uh, we couple the two subsystems, so the liquid and the solid problem, by imposing the continuity of so this equation, basically, on the moving wall. And we obtain this form, this equation, after integrating by parts and substituting. And uh, now we have two surface terms, this one and, th and that one. This one is responsible for our motion of the, s of the solid, and it is imposed on, a as on the fluid band moving wall. While this term takes into account, uh, for example, non-homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions. This is again a nonlinear problem. It is quite clear because the, the domain, for example, here gamma s, depends on eta, on our variables, on our displacement. 
So now I will introduce some principles of uh, adjoint optimal control. Uh, we can say that the so-called standard ap approach to optimization is a very naive approach, where you one chooses uh, the, the target of the optimization, and then the chooses his favorite control parameter, for example, the, a velocity, a pressure, or some material properties. Then one performs the simulation, performs the analysis of the results, and checks whether uh, he's satisfied with his results. If not, he has to change the control parameter, but he has no particular uh, control law. So this is a quite simple approach, but it's not really optimal. So in an optimal control approach, uh, we, we use a very strong mathematical formulation. So our target is expressed by mean of a cost functional that I will show you later. And by minimizing the Lagrangian of the problem, we obtain the so-called optimality system that can be represented here. In the optimality system, we have equations that are responsible for the physics of the problem, the so-called state equation. And the adjoint and the control equation will give information about how to change the parameters in order to uh, reach the target. So this problem has to be solved. At, at the end of this uh, uh, problem, you, you have found your optimal control parameters. So it is uh, an, an, an efficient way to solve optimal control problems, but of course the implementation can be quite challenging. So what is the definition of optimal control problem? This is the definition by Gunzberger, and it is an attempt to control the mechanical or thermodynamical state of our fluid or solid in order to achieve the desired purpose. So we have different types of control, in, for example, in FSI. The first one is a distributed control. So basically, you can think of a source term in the equation. And for example, uh, you may think of a thermal source uh, applied into some part of, the, of your system in order to change the temperature in, in your system. It is a very powerful method from the computational point of view. But it is really applicable in practice because you don't have usually access to inside your domain. Another approach is the boundary control, where you, your control parameter acts as, on a, as a boundary condition on the boundary of your system. And you may think of the cold fluid injection to cool down turbine blades, the temperature. This is a weaker approach from the computational point of view, but it is uh, more, uh, more used in uh, industrial applications. And finally, the last type of control is shape control, where you change the domain shape. For example, you may think of uh, uh, the design of airplanes or wind turbine in order to um, increase the lift uh, with uh, the same drag or reduce the drag and so on. This is the least efficient method from the computational point of view, but it is very used, for example, in aerodynamics. And this is how it uh, uh, can be considered in our FSI problem. So we have a, the so-called control region, that is this one in yellow, that is the region where we want to match our target, satisfy our target. That can be, for example, a velocity or displacement matching problem, or we want to reduce the drag here, for example. And, uh, this picture refers to a boundary control, where the, the red line on the left is the so-called control surface, where we can change, for example, the, the fluid pressure, the fluid velocity, or we can also uh, change the, our, the, the mass flow, and in that case we would be talking about a, a lamp to control. On the right, there is uh, an image of a distributed control, we have again our target region, but now the, the control can act not on a boundary, but inside the domain, for example, here on the solid, uh, for example, using a volumetric force, as I will show you later. Or we can also change the material properties, for example, the young modulus of the solid. And in that case, we can um, say that is, it is a parameter estimation problem. So, as I said before, we have to define an objective functional. Uh, 
and this is uh, an objective functional. So we have the first term here in this equation um, that takes into account actually our uh, target. For example, we can have a matching profile. That means that we have our state variable phi, and we want that state variable to be as close as possible to a certain value, phi d, that is chosen by us. Or we may wish to have a zero gradient, and if phi, for example, is a temperature, it means that uh, we want to have zero flux, it flux. Or we can uh, want to, for example, um, match some kinetic energy value or vorticity or so on. And in that objective functional, we also add these, the last two terms that are used to limit the, the control in order to avoid, uh, for example, distributional control in distributional spaces, such as Dirac functions. And, uh, for example, if you consider only the second term here, our control would be in the Sobler space L2. While considering also this term, our control would be in the Sobler space H1. And uh, we have these two terms that are so-called regularization parameters that are used to uh, weight the, the, um, the importance of the uh, regularization against the objective. Of course, if we take higher values of the regularization term, our control would be very less effective. But if we neglect them, we may have problems if our uh, desired value, for example, is not solution of the so-called inverse problem. And of course, if we s are solving a boundary or shape control problem, these three uh, integrals that now are computed on uh, the domain have to be computed on surfaces. And so, um, by doing so, the, the optimization problem can be considered a minimization problem. And to solve a minimization problem, we use the Lagrange multiplier method. So you have your objective functional there, and uh, you have to uh, compute the augmented functional or augmented Lagrangian by summing to the uh, cost functional the uh, FSI equation that here rep represents the, the constraints of the problem, and multiply them by the appropriate Lagrange multipliers that in this context are also called adjoint variables. And by doing so, what we have obtained is that we are starting from an unconstrained minimization problem, from a constrained minimization problem, and now we have an unconstrained one because the constraints have been taken into account in the augmented functional. And so we can use standard method for the solution of unconstrained minimization problems. So we have to impose the first order necessary condition to find the minimum of the augmented functional. And we compute the derivatives. Uh, when we compute the derivatives with respect to the state variables phi, we obtain the adjoint system. When we take the derivatives when with respect to the uh, adjoint equation, we obtain the state system again. And finally, when we derive with respect to the control, we obtain the control equation. So this method is quite powerful to achieve the minimization, bec in particular because it is quite straightforward to obtain the optimality system that will be composed of the adjoint system, state system, and control equation. However, it may lead to an high computational cost. And in particular, this method is used to find only local minimums. So don't expect to find the global minimum of the problem, but just some local minimum. So it means that the, the optimal solution that you are going to find depends both on the history of your uh, algorithm, for example, and on the starting point on the initial value of your control parameter. So in order to solve this problem, I used a gradient-based algorithm. It is a, the simplest one, a steep descent method. So you, you, at the beginning, you have to choose an initial value for your control parameter. With that, you can solve your FSI problem and compute an initial function. 
then you have to solve the adjoint equation that tells you how you have to update your control parameter, for example, here a force, but can be a velocity or pressure. And with that updated control, you have to solve again the FSI system and compute the objective function. Then you have tri three possibilities, bas basically. The first one is that your new functional is lower than the previous one, and then you are satisfied, you are moving toward the minimum, and you have to take this way. Otherwise, it may be that your new functional is higher than the previous one. It means that you have moved correctly in the correct direction, but you have taken a step which is too long, too large, and you have to reduce the so-called step length parameter and perform the so-called line search here. So you have to compute on the new control and again solve the FSI system. Finally, you may have that your previous functional is almost equal to the new one, and so no more improvements can be obtained, and at, at the end uh, you have found your optimal control. This is the algorithm that I have used. And now I will show you a couple of examples. The first one is a, an example of distributed control, so using a force. Uh, so this is the objective functional that I have considered. We have three terms. The first one is used to solve a fluid velocity matching problem, so where our target is that the velocity in some part of the fluid is closer to a value Vd chosen by me. The second term is used to take into account a similar problem, but considering the solid displacement here. So this is computing in the, in the solid part. And finally, the last term takes into account the control parameter, the norm of the control parameter, that now is a force and it is acting on the solid. So those are the equations that we have to solve, that are the the one that I've shown you in the, in the first part of the presentation. Here we have the force acting on the solid sub problem. This is the form that has the a joint FSI system, and what I want you to notice is that we have these two terms boxed that act as a source term for the adjoint equation, and those are the terms coming from the objective functional. Finally, we have the control equation that comes from the taking the derivative in the control direction, and we obtain here an algebraic control equation for the force for our control parameter that is proportional to the adjoint velocity scaled by the so-called regularization parameter. For the adjoint system, we also have interface condition here, these two, that are automatically satisfied again since we are solving uh, also the joint si equation with a monolithic approach. And we have boundary conditions that are of the same time of the uh, boundary condition for the corresponding state variable, for example, for the, if you consider the, the velocity, the adjoint velocity as the same type of boundary condition, but in homogeneous form. So where we have Dirichlet boundary condition, we again have Dirichlet boundary condition. This is the first, exam the first example. On the left, in light gray, we have uh, the fluid uh, domain, and on the right, in darker gray, the solid domain. The dotted region is the region, the control region, where we want to uh, match our target. So taking a look at the boundary conditions, we have that the, the bottom is an inlet for the fluid, the top is the outlet. On the left, we have a symmetry boundary condition. The right boundary, CD, is the moving wall, so the solid is left free to move on the right or even to the left. And we have that this is the interface. And all the other boundaries are fixed, uh, and we impose no slip boundary condition. Here we have some physical properties. And the target that I have chosen for this problem is here. I want to that in that region, in the dotted region, the displacement as a uniform value of 5 cm, for example, for the uh, horizontal component of the, of the displacement. And uh, so first I have to solve the state, pr the uncontrolled problem, so without control. 
And what we get is that in the middle we have the, the displacement, and this is the more or less this region is the control region, and we can see that the displacement has its own uh, the higher value of the displacement is much lower than the target one. Here it is 0 0.02, and that the solid is quite curved, it's not flat uh, in that region. While here on the, the right we have the, the, the velocity in the fluid. And then, after the end of our algorithm, on, again on the left we have the velocity in the fluid, N nothing really interesting in that. But in the middle we have the solid displacement, and we can see that in that region, from here to here, that is the control region, the solid is more or less uh, vertical, perfectly vertical, and the, the value of the displacement is more or less the one that we wanted to reach. Here on the right, I'm plotting the, the force, the volumetric force that is acting on the solid, and we can see that the force is quite intense here and here. This is a more or less a symmetric problem, and it is pushing hard to the right, just outside the uh, control region to push to the right, so to satisfy our target. While here in the middle of the control region, it is pushing uh, with less intensity, but to the left, in order to keep the solid vertically aligned and not curved. Uh, some more quantitative uh, results here. I performed three simulations with different regularization. As I said, less regularization means a powerful control, but we may have problem if it is not that the target is not solution of the inverse problem. So what 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 we, what we can see is that by reducing the regularization, in fact, the functional gets reduced more and more, and the average value of the displacement computed only in the control region approaches our target one. Now I'll move to a more complicated example. Now I use the volumetric force to change the, the to match a target in the solid. Now in this we have this other geometry. We have the fluid, this is a fluid channel more or less, and there is this solid obstacle in the middle. And that one on the top right in colored in red is the control region. So we start looking at the boundary condition. I impose a fixed pressure at the inlet and at the outlet. Outlet, So we have a fixed difference in pressure between the inlet and the outlet. And we can expect that the position of the solid determines the, the mass flow rate, and that as a consequence, the velocity that uh, the fluid reaches in the, in a, for example, here at the outlet. And this the target that I choose for that simulation is that velocity here, 0 0.065. I will show you later why. And uh, this is more challenging because we are using a force in the solid uh, domain to affect the liquid behavior. And here are the results for the reference case without control. So there is no force pushing the solid, just the fluid. And we can see on the left we have the, the velocity. And uh, we can see that in the in this region here, that is the target region, the velocity is lower than the target one. And uh, here on the right I reported the the pressure profile with isoline. And we can see that we have lar great pressure drop near the obstacle. And here are the results of the control case. Here I'm plotting the, again the velocity and also the force acting on the on the solid. It will be reported also in the next slide. So what we see is that the velocity here is higher, more or less. It is quite close to the value that we wanted to obtain. And this is obtained since the the solid is uh, more deformed and so the in, in the chan in the fluid channel. The, the mass flow is higher and the velocity is higher. So again, some more uh, clear results. So 
I reported again the, the result for three different uh, values of the regularization parameter. This is high regularization, intermediate regularization, less regularization. And we notice that with, the, of course, this is the, the solid, and those tips represent the force. With a very high regularization, very high regularization, the force is cannot act because it's limited by our algorithm. And why here the, the force is pushing very hard the solid to the right, and in particular, the most intense uh, force is acting here near the tip because it's the part of the solid where the force can act most effectively. And here on the left, we have two plots of the velocity near. Uh, on a horizontal line and on a vertical line, passing through the control region for these three cases. And we notice that the velocity, for example, here, is very close to our target of 0 0.65. OK, so now I will show some other results of a pressure boundary control. So now the control will act on the boundary as, a, as the pressure. And so we have another objective function with two terms. The first one here is used to solve the, again, a solid displacement matching problem. The, the main difference between this case and the previous one is that here the, this integral is computed on the, uh, so on the boundary of the fluid that represents the solid. And the second term here is the regularization term that limits the control. Now the control is the pressure that is acting on the fluid inlet, for example. And uh, it is imposed, of course, as a boundary condition for the fluid soup problem. Here we have the adjoint equation in the, in the domain. We don't have the source term, because the source term for the adjoint now are imposed, have to be imposed as a boundary condition here. Th this term comes from the um, objective functional and has to be imposed on the solid moving wall. Again, we obtain an algebraic control equation because we are solving for the pressure as a control. If we had used velocity, we would have obtained a, a um, differential, differential equation. And again, we have um, the boundary condition for the joint. This is the, the test that I will show you today. This is our geometry on the left. So this is the, the left boundary AD is the control surface where we impose our control pressure. We have that the right boundary is the one that we consider as the solid, and it is able to move, for example, to the right. And the other boundary, so the bottom, and the top are fixed, and we impose no slip boundary condition. So this is the result for our uh, reference case with no control. And we, not we notice that uh, uh, it is more or less a symmetric configuration. Uh, this is the symmetry axis. And uh, of course, the velocity field is more or less zero, since the fluid cannot uh, go anywhere at the at steady state. And uh, we have, so in order to break this symmetric configuration, we want to solve a complex uh, target where the we consider these two points here, one and two. And the objective for the first point is minus 0 0.01, meaning that we want to, that this point goes to the left of this reference configuration, and the bottom point goes to the right. For example, this goes here, and this one goes here. And those, this is uh, our result. Here I'm showing the, the velocity. And there I'm showing the pressure on that boundary, so the control pressure. As we can see, the pressure has this up and down profile, more or less. And this is needed to obtain this configuration that is the one that we wanted, more or less, to obtain. And I have I, um, done again, uh, some three simulations with different regularization. And here it is quite clear that uh, 
the, the final solution depends on the history of the optimization algorithm since we obtained values that are quite similar for the point on the top, more or less, the, the displacement, while for the point on the bottom, we obtained very different uh, solution, final values, but the objective function has been reduced in all these three cases. So this is a peculiarity of, the, of this kind of algorithm. So I just want to draw some conclusion. So what I show you today is the use of a standard monolithic FSI solver, and then how to uh, use a coiter shell model to reduce the computational effort. I've shown you both distributed and boundary pressure uh, steady optimal control problem. And uh, as one can expect, uh, we obtain that the pressure boundary control is less effective since, of course, the, the control has to act on uh, far farther away from the target region. However, all these problems shown a uh, good accuracy. And uh, yeah, so the, the joint approach is, uh, is quite good for solving these kind of problems. If one wants to improve that, of course, one can think of these two possible strategies. The, the first one is to use more advanced gradient algorithm, for example, conjugate gradient or what you want, uh, so to re reduce the computational time and reducing the number of iterations that your algorithm uh, uses to reach the, the, the optimal solution. And another approach could be, instead of using uh, um, gradient algorithms, solving all the optimality system in the so-called one-shot approach, so all in a single problem, single matrix, for example. And uh, to reduce, however, th this would require quite a lot of computational time. But we if we want to reduce, we can use, for example, Vanka-type smoother, so solving patch, small patches of this problem. And of course, using multi-grid solver would certainly help. And that's all for me. Okay, so here um, these results do not really show that the um, initial value of your control parameter change, changes the uh, final solution because I use the same control, the initial condition for all the, the cases. But uh, yeah, I don't have any results here to show, but yeah, this is the case because um, this is a peculiarity of the a joint algorithm with a grounded base uh, algorithm that uh, marches towards the local minimum. Because, for example, if you have a one, it, it is quite simple in 1D to imagine. You may think you may have a big hole and another small hole. And uh, when you are in close to the small hole, the gradient is, uh, pu is uh, directed towards the, that local minimum. And once you are in that region, you can't go away from, from there. And th that's more or less the same for more complicated problems. But yeah, I, I don't have results showing that here. Ah, some applications to biology. OK, no. Uh, this is just uh, some uh, general possible applications. I haven't focused on a particular application on a particular field. But yes, of course, this can be uh, applied to at the beginning to, for example, uh, vessels and to, for example, uh, have some 
to, to limit the, the displacement, for example, near some bypass, uh, and th th this, is, this is used, uh, there, there is some literature about that, for example, from Quarteroni. Uh, for here. You mean here? Yeah, yeah because w w when I in integrate by parts, this term I obtain, of course, the volumetric term here and here, and these two surface terms that. Uh, so the interface condition, the you, you can find them in literature. Um, I'm not sure, but I think that the uh, shear stress ma might be zero. Otherwise, we would have some slip. I'm not sure about that. Maybe I can check that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah, so, um, well, thank you. Very interesting. Um, I didn't understand the application where you have a force as a control parameter. So how is the force applied? Maybe I missed something. Uh, i shown two so cases. You have a force in the solid, or you have a velocity that induces a force in the solid? No, here, for example, this test. Uh, This one? Yeah. This test, the force is acting on the solid. It is. It's a, it's a force that is given by the velocity or the force that you impose as a control? This is a force that I impose as a control. It's in the solid? Yeah, only in the solid. And then another one? Um, yeah. um, another question. Uh, um, so you talked about how gradient-based uh, algorithm are, are affected by the initial condition. So the one you showed us are the best initial condition you've tested? No, of course. Uh, those are just some initial condition that worked. Uh, of course, you may have um, an infinite number of initial boundary, uh, initial conditions. So uh, this is just uh, um, some choice to see that the algorithm works. And it works well. And another one. <laughs> <laughs> Did you consider um, comparing these um, test cases uh, doing optimization in a derivative-free way, so to be sure that your minimum is actually the global one and not the, and not a local one? No, I just use this uh, uh, gradient-based algorithm. So. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.